they're at the end of 2023 and that means the Galaxy S23 has been on the market for the best part of a year. So it's not new at all. Plus, Samsung's about to unveil its next series of flagship phones. But here's the thing. With Samsung's phones, there's always a sense that it's worth waiting until it's older before buying because it inevitably gets dropped much cheaper. And with each new update that becomes less major than the one before, could this actually be the best time to buy one? I've been using the S23 off and on for the last year, and I have some thoughts on that. So first up, the elephant in the room. The Galaxy S24 is coming very soon, and it will replace the S23. But what do we know about the S24 so far? Well, nothing official from Samsung's own mouth, but there have been plenty of leaks and rumors about the next flagship Galaxy S series. And as you'd expect, it looks like we're getting another iterative update with the S24. Rumors and leaks have suggested we'll see a device with a flatter frame, but with a similar design to the S23. And it's been reported we'll see 120 hz refresh rate displays that can go down as low as 1 hz unlike the S23, which bottoms out at a much higher rate. Until Samsung announced it, we don't know if this is 100% true, but it's also been claimed that Samsung is going to split chipsets like they did with the older models. So the Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 is going to be in the US models, but the European models will get the Exynos chip. So another reason to pick the Snapdragon powered older model instead, perhaps. It'll run Android 14 with One UI 6, but the S23 already has that. And it's likely to have a three camera system very similar to the S23. So really, if rumors are accurate, that's not a massive change. So moving to the main topic, the Galaxy S23 nearly a year after it's launched. Now, I could go over the same old ground and talk about the compact feel, the lightness, the attractive design. When considering long-term suitability as a phone, I think durability is far more important. It's no good having a phone that looks nice and fits in the hand well that's just going to break as soon as it even looks wrong at some concrete let alone makes contact with it. Now, for the most part, the S23 in my pocket has, relatively speaking, stood the test of time. It's not especially scratch resistant in my experience, having become marked on the back within the first few days of use. However, the phone is sturdy. Samsung's Armour Aluminium, as the company brands it, is solid, and it seems to soak up your classic impact accidents without too much trouble. In fact, there's not much in the way of marking or denting on the frame at all. It is shiny though, so I did find myself cleaning fingerprint smudges of it quite frequently. Now, of course, size is still a key part of the phone's charm. Even 12 months after use, no other manufacturer has really matched Samsung in that regard, at least not for a flagship device. The Zenfone 10 exists and is really very good, but it's not as slim. And Samsung's still one of the few that has managed to get really skinny bezels right the way around the display on all four sides with the corner radiuses rounded to match the outer frame. It's pretty fantastic and still surprisingly rare. I won't lie, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with Samsung's software efforts. I always have. On the one hand, there are things that irritate, like the fact that the app drawer forces you to scroll horizontally and not vertically, despite being launched vertically. It's counterintuitive. There's also the fact that Samsung loads it to the hilt with lots of extra bloat. It has its own services and stock apps that it wants you to use over Google's, but because it's Android, it still has all of Google's as well. What I can't object to, however, is Samsung's commitment to supporting phones and, as importantly, its speed at rolling out software updates. It's important for keeping phones secure, reacting to threats, and also means you get to keep your phone for a long time without worrying about your software being out of date. In fact, this S23 has been running Android 14-based One UI 6 for the past couple of months. It was one of the first devices to get the official software after Google's own Pixel, and will continue to get major updates until Android 17 is launched in 2027, and security patches will continue for a little while longer after that. Now, this particular update is a fairly minor one, at least on the surface. There are a few cosmetic changes, like the rejig lock screen customization, a redesigned button layout and the drop-down shade, improved album art for video and music in the notification panel, and a richer weather widget and simpler app icons, but, but none of that is really a big deal. As far as longevity goes, there are, again, not many others out there beyond the Pixel that will keep you updated for longer than Samsung's flagship devices. Another reason it's safe and sensible to buy the Galaxy S23 even a year after it's launch. Now, I did want to talk a little bit about speed, performance, and battery life, if only because here's one area it might make more sense to get the S23 than wait for the S24, at least in some markets, mostly European and UK regions. Now, simply put, the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 inside the S23 has been one of Qualcomm's most reliable and efficient processors we've seen in any Android phone. 
It runs things with effortless grace, doesn't get really hot under load, it doesn't slow down or drain the battery too much, it just does its job really well. Now I can't say for certain, at least not yet, but it's very likely the next version of the smaller Galaxy S series phones will have an Exynos chipset in some market. And historically that means a less efficient, less reliable chip that runs warm and slows down. Now we don't know if that's the case this time out because it's not out yet, but if it follows history the Snapdragon powered S23 might be a better buy in Europe, the UK and other markets where the Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 on the S24 isn't going to be available. Which brings me on to battery life, and what feels like the first time in a small Galaxy S, at least in my time of testing these phones, the battery life is actually decent on the Galaxy S23. Even on my heavier usage days that went beyond my typical light two to three hours of use, I didn't really struggle to get through a full day on a charge. Given that it's only got a 3,900 milliamp hour battery inside, that's pretty good going. It handles standby time well, conserving its energy, and can even handle extreme gaming sessions without draining the battery too much. Even months after I first unboxed it, the performance is still solid. Now this is a long term review, and there are a couple of things that never really changed that much from the first two weeks of using the phone until now, and that's the display and the cameras. They get the job done as well as when it was new. The display is bright, vivid, with colours that pop and lots of contrast, and it can also reach 120Hz, but I found at times when moving from static pages to moving ones, like swiping home or dropping notifications, it did stutter a little every now and then. And Samsung's home launcher seems to be a bit slow in general. And yes, being able to drop quickly and efficiently all the way down to 1Hz would be amazing. And up there with the top displays, but it's not something I ever really thought about when using it for gaming or watching videos. It's great to have, but not always necessary. As for the cameras, it's got that classic Samsung approach. Colours are super saturated, even giving overcast skies and pale buildings more pop than you'd see in real life. And this is one area I think Samsung could improve the most, because it's not necessarily just about its approach to colours, which is mostly personal preference. It's also in the detail. Taking photos of trees or bushes, especially in low light, delivered images that lacked realistic detail. Instead giving branches, leaves and the gaps between them this weird streaky oil painting look. They're definitely not poor cameras, and the versatility on offer from having three times zoom with an an ultra wide and a primary is really useful, but pictures generally came out looking deeper, sharper, and with better color and texture when using the Pixel 8 or the iPhone 15 Pro. So, in the end, no, the S23 is not a perfect phone. No phone is, nor will there ever be one, but that's not the point. The point, oddly enough, and the reason for this video is that now that it's older, cheaper, and soon to be superseded by the S24, it's a better buy than it was at launch. It's a brilliant compact flagship phone with all the power of a bigger device. It's got the latest software with support for a good number of years. It has a versatile camera system, a great display, and it's just the right size for easy one-handed use. Plus, it doesn't cost crazy flagship money anymore, it's pretty affordable. And yes, sometimes the software is a bit jittery at times and loaded with a bunch of needless extras. And the camera system isn't as good as the bigger Ultra models or the iPhone 15 Pro models, but its combination of size, portability, and power make it a super choice at this point in time. If you can live without having the latest and greatest, this phone will serve you very well. Let me know what you think of this phone a year later in the comments below. Is it worth the money now? Also, you can get me on threads. I'm at Cam Bunton. If you did like this video, please do leave a thumbs up, subscribe, and tap the notification bell. And I'll see you again in the next one. Bye for now.